Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we'll be discussing Book 1, Chapter 1 of Memories of Ice, a novel of the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of 12. Of <laughs> our, I'm just kidding. It's just Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. <laughs> If we ever have to do 12 hours on a single chapter, <laughs> my God. <laughs> we're either going to gain new fans or we're going to lose the ones that we've got. And if we want you people to hang out, so please, <laughs> y'all don't go anywhere. <laughs> this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And since we're just beginning, I'm going to really work hard to spoil everything from here on out. So welcome to the new spoiler-free voice of the Malaza Brotherhood. Again, I'm sorry. I just can't resist. Sorry, I kind of jacked up about starting members of ICE here. So now that we're past the prologue, this is kind of like the real start. I'm really excited. Okay. Keep it together. I will keep it together. <laughs> <laughs> a quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme past oh. violence. <laughs> Listener discretion is advised. Is it extreme or more like uh, global? <laughs> I would say I both. Like that. <laughs> right, there we go. Okay. <laughs> our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right. Book one The Spark and the Ashes. The book begins with an excerpt from the Imperial Campaigns. The Panion War. This is Volume 4, Genabacus, by Imrigin Talibant, who was born in 1151 Burn Sleep. I thought this name sounded familiar, so I went back and looked. At the beginning of Gardens of the Moon, we had an excerpt from the Imperial Campaigns Volume 4 as well. This gave us some background on the situation on Genabacus as the book kicked off. Okay, right on. Quote, Five mages, an adjunct, countless imperial demons, and the debacle that was Daruzistan all served to publicly justify the outlawry proclaimed by the empress on Dujek One-Arm and his battered legions. That this freed One-Arm and his host to launch a new campaign, this time as an independent military force, to fashion his own unholy alliances which were destined to result in a continuation of the dreadful sorcery enfilade on Genabacus, is, one might argue, incidental. Granted, the countless victims of that devastating time might, should Hood grant them the privilege, voice an entirely different opinion. Perhaps the most poetic detail of what would come to be called the Panion Wars was, in fact, a precursor to the entire campaign. The casual, indifferent destruction of a lone stone bridge by the Jagut tyrant on his ill-fated march to Darujistan. End quote. And it's amazing how random chance can play into the goings-on in the world. And this makes me think of chaos theory, which I, of course, learned about as a child watching Jurassic Park in 1993. Ah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know about it before that movie? Elsewhere. Yes, I learned about it from uh, Dirk, uh, probably more from uh, Douglas Adams, Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency. Okay. And how was it presented there? Oh, good gracious. He just always saw everything as strangely interconnected. He was the guy looking for the butterfly wings flapping. Okay. Basically, in, in stuff like this. And it's hard to explain to gently. I don't remember it. It's been since it came out in the 90s as a book. Now, there has been two television treatments, strangely enough. One of them with Elijah Wood. It's the, it looks like the same bunch that did Wilfred almost. It's like two or three seasons long, and I've meant to watch it. I started watching some of it, but it's so completely, I think, different. These people are using chance and things in their favor, and I don't recall that from the book. <laughs> Mm. All I remember is a rain god being there, and the cl this guy didn't understand that he was a rain god. He didn't know it to some guy and driving around in a car, and everywhere he went, he's trying to go find the sun, and he couldn't because the clouds loved him and followed him everywhere and rained on him in praise, and he didn't understand that he was a rain god. And that was the only character I really remember. <laughs> if you were a rain god, would you have an Eeyore-esque personality? I think he was. Yeah, I think he was a very downer kind of fellow because he was, yeah, he was always wanting to find some place where it was sunshine. He couldn't understand why it's always raining. Mm. And 
like I said, it was never, I don't even think that guy ever finds that out. I mean, he's just, you know, he's just a character in the books that you meet kind of here and there. And he's like, well, it's still raining here, this fella. And he's like, you know, <laughs> no, I don't think anyone is kind enough or knows that he's a rain god. Points out the fact, it's like, oh, by the way, you're a rain god. They're just kind of into you. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. rain clouds are really into you, buddy. <laughs> So I found this example online for the chains of cause and effect, which I believe would apply to this situation with the bridge getting destroyed by the Jagoot tyrant and then everything else that happens later in the book. The initial condition, an uncomfortable pillow, which causes a bad night's sleep and that causes poor performance by a soccer player or a football, causes their team loses the World Cup, causes low morale in their country, triggers a recession, causes a revolution which causes a complete collapse of society well in, in the south american countries in particular during the pablo escobar days <laughs> this was a bad deal for the for those fellows they could you know those guys couldn't go back home those soccer players couldn't really you could be murdered yes oh my Not just gosh. by escobar just by the local people might murder them for just losing the world cup man it was kind of this is like not that long ago, I kid you not, but uh, this is kind of the, have you ever heard of the For the Want of a Nail? Yes, but go ahead and run through it. For Want of a Nail, the shoe was lost. For Want of a Shoe, the horse was lost. For Want of a Horse, the rider was lost. All for the Want of a Nail. And then the rider was, of course, carrying some type of important message. Oh, I'm assuming it's all, yes. Some message to a king. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm assuming, yes, it's all going to go collapse of society. <laughs> Am I the only one that cares about the rules? Yeah. The calm Walter Sobchak quote there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Am I the only one that cares about the rules? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the exact recollection at first because the language is a little modified, sir. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, chapter one. The chapter begins in the 1164th year of Burns' sleep, two months after the Darujistan fate. This is also the fourth year of the Panyan Daman, and it is also the Talon year of the second gathering, which I presume the first gathering was the year they took the vow. Do you agree with that? Yes. So <laughs> I do. So we did we just mark it zero here? <laughs> are you are you trying to I'm sorry. run I'm back? Sorry, dude. <laughs> it, it, it just two it, references it just, in as many oh. paragraphs. <laughs> It could be resisted, sir. <laughs> it could not resist. <laughs> if you can give me another one in the next paragraph, I will be shocked and amazed. <laughs> okay. All right. Noted, oh, sir. No, dude, I, I, I see one immediately in the first sentence. All right. <laughs> the br the bridges Gadrobi limestone blocks lay scattered in the bank's churned mud, as if a god's hand had swept down to shatter the bridge in a single petty gesture of contempt. And that, Gruntle suspected, was but a half step from the truth. <laughs> Did you see there that I missed? I'm sorry, what have I missed it, here? My buddies didn't die face down in the muck. <laughs> I'm still trying to wipe the tears from. Okay, oh good gracious! There was, it was too right much pressure. Sure, too much. Okay, oh you're right, you're right. So they did lay like, scattered in the bunks. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost it. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I disappointed that one, folks. Let's get ourselves together, <laughs> okay. and we're going to proceed. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> the news had trickled back into Darujistan less than a week after the destruction, as the first eastward-bound caravans this side of the river reached the crossing to find that where once stood a serviceable bridge was now nothing but rubble. Rumors whispered of an ancient demon, unleashed by agents of the Malazan Empire, striding down out of the Gadrobi Hills bent on the annihilation of Darujistan itself. Gruntle spat next to the carriage. He had his doubts about that tale. Granted, there'd been strange goings on the night of the city's fate two months back. Not that he'd been sober enough to notice much of anything. And sufficient witnesses to give credence to the sightings of dragons, demons, and the terrifying descent of Moonspawn. But any conjuring with the power to lay waste to an entire countryside would have reached Darujistan. And since the city was not a smoldering heap, or no more than was usual after a citywide celebration, clearly nothing did. No, far more likely a god's hand, or possibly an earthquake, though the Gadrobi hills were not known to be restless. Perhaps Byrne had shifted uneasy in her eternal sleep. And a couple of reminders here. 
taking us back to what took place in these hills, when Raced first emerged from his barrow, he reached down into the earth and sent some power there, causing the hills to split and spew lava in places. Also, as Solana and the three Tistandine dragons fought it out with Raced, I imagine huge craters would be visible in the aftermath as he worked his way towards Jerusalem because he was raising yeah. the earth up in their face and a lot of sorcery being thrown around. Oh yeah. Do you assume that this like collapsed bridge, that's kind of like the outer rim area of destruction that race did and all that sorcery there. That was some destruction. I remember him destroying that bridge because it's very well spelled out in the book gardens of the moon. The bridge of destruction is spelled out. Remember that? I don't explicitly remember, but this is that same bridge, I believe, that Ganoes went across with Cole. Yeah, with Cole, yeah. And he got the city guards to take him in because he was injured. I can't remember where that fight ended with the dragons, where they went off. Yeah, people could hear it in town, but they didn't know what was going on. Oh, yeah, they thought it was a thunderstorm. Yeah, So, my, but my assumption is like that bridge was like the furthest point of destruction from Raced himself. And that conflict and that little bit of conflict with those dragons was that bridge. And then that was, you know, then he made it elsewhere. Or, or not, he didn't make it elsewhere, but other things happened. <laughs> so you're saying this is kind of the last site of the battle? before he got into Darujistan, is that? Yeah, yeah, you know? that's kind of what I'm getting at, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. It doesn't sound like Gruntle has seen any visible signs of this supposed conflict. No, he sees it everywhere around him. What oh, he's okay. saying is he doesn't think whatever force this was made it to Darujistan. Oh, yes. Because oh, okay. given Sorry. the destruction around him, there's craters everywhere, the grass is burned. He doesn't believe in the stories at this point. He just thinks something was going on out here, but it never made it all the way there. Right, I copied that. The truth of things now stood before him, or rather did not stand, but lay scattered to Hood's Gate and beyond. And the fact remained, whatever games the gods played, it was hardworking, dirt-poor bastards like him who suffered for it. The old ford was back in use, 30 paces upriver from where the bridge had been built. It hadn't seen traffic in centuries, and with a week of unseasonal rains, both banks had become a morass. Caravan trains crowded the crossing, the ones on what used to be ramps and the ones out in the swollen river hopelessly mired down, while dozens more waited on the trails with the tempers of merchants, guards, and beasts climbing by the hour. And what a mess. It sounds like they need some molasses sappers and some Marines out there <laughs> to get those wagons out of the mud, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, maybe they could build a stone bridge under the water. Yeah. They could just blow it all up and clear the way that way. <laughs> Two days now, waiting to cross, and Gruntle was pleased with his meager troop. Islands of calm they were. Harlow had waded out to a remnant of the bridge's near side pile, and now sat atop it, fishing pole in hand. Stani Manakis had led a ragged band of fellow caravan guards to Storby's wagon, and Storby wasn't too displeased to be selling Gredfallen ale by the mug at exorbitant prices. That the ale casks were destined for a wayside inn outside Saltoan was just too bad for the expectant innkeeper. If things continued as they did, there'd be a market growing up here, then a hood damn town. Eventually, some officious planner in Darujistan would conclude that it'd be a good thing to rebuild the bridge, and in ten or so years, it would finally get done. Unless, of course, the town had become a going concern, in which case they'd send a tax collector. <laughs> the tax assessors always need to wet their beaks, don't they? Oh, uh, yes, they do. I, I, I've always assumed that could be a dangerous gig in those days and age. Heck, it could be dangerous in certain places today. But <laughs> Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Gruntle was equally pleased with his employer's equanimity at the delay. News was the merchant Mankey on the other side of the river had burst a blood vessel in his head and promptly died, which was more typical of the breed. No, their master Kiruli ran against the grain, enough to threaten Gruntle's cherished disgust for merchants in general. Then again, Kiruli's list of peculiar traits had led Gruntle to suspect that the man wasn't a merchant at all. Not that it mattered. Coin was coin, and Kiruli's rates were good. Better than average, in fact. He heard someone shout, You there, sir! Gruntle pulled his gaze from Harlow's fruitless fishing. A grizzled old man stood beside the carriage, squinting up at him. Gruntle growled, Damned imperious of you, that tone, since by the rags you're wearing, you're either the world's worst merchant or a poor man's servant. The man said, manservant, to be precise. My name is Emancipor Rees. As for my master's being poor, to the contrary. We have, however, been on the road for a long time. 
Gruntle said, I'll accept that since your accent is unrecognizable. And coming from me, that's saying a lot. What do you want, Reese? Reese scratched the silvery stubble that lined his jaw and said, careful questioning among this mob had gleaned a consensus that, as far as caravan guards go, you're a man who's earned respect. Gruntle said, as far as caravan guards go, I might well have at that. Your point? Reese said, my masters wish to speak with you, sir, if you're not too busy. We have camped not far from here. Gruntle studied Reese for a moment, then grunted. I'd have to clear with my employer any meetings with other merchants. Reese said, by all means, sir, and you may assure him that my masters have no wish to entice you away or otherwise compromise your contract. Gruntle said, is that a fact? All right, wait there. He swung himself down from the buckboard on the side opposite Reese. He stepped up to the small, ornately framed door and knocked once. It opened softly, and from the relative darkness within the carriage's confines loomed Karuli's round, expressionless face. Karuli said, Yes, Captain, by all means go. I admit as to some curiosity about this man's two masters. Be most studious in noting details of your impending encounter, and, if you can, determine what precisely they have been up to since yesterday. Gruntle grunted to disguise his surprise at Karuli's clearly unnatural depth of knowledge. The man had yet to leave the carriage, then said, as you wish, sir. I wonder how hot it is where they're located right now, because I cannot imagine being cooped up in a carriage with no airflow at this time of year here. You'd probably die from heat exposure. Yeah, that's kind of, well, you know, that's what I've always kind of assumed, that it was a pretty warm spot they were in, but Grunnell himself suspects this fellow being something more. And I'm assuming he's something more if he's got, you know, when before the guy, when he opens the door, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead with what? Yeah, go, go ahead with what you were just talking about. How did you know I was talking, you know, kind of deal. So, I mean, maybe he could just hear it. But some of it, I kind of get the, for some reason, I get the impression that the way this guy's in the dark there, like it's almost cool in there. <laughs> really? With the sun beating down on it? Uh, yes. Even with the sun beating down for like, I, like he's got some kind of magic kicking in there, I think, to keep cool. Okay. Karuli added, oh. And retrieve Stani on your way back. She has had far too much to drink and has become most argumentative. <laughs> Gruntle said, maybe I should collect her now then. She's liable to poke someone full of holes with that rapier of hers. I know her moods. Karuli said, ah, well, send Harlow then. Gruntle said, uh, he's liable to join in, sir. Karuli said, yet you speak highly of them. Gruntle replied, I do. Not to be too immodest, sir. The three of us working the same contract or as good as twice that number when it comes to protecting a master and his merchandise. That's why we're so expensive. Karuli said, your rates were high? I see. Hmm. Inform your two companions then <laughs> that an aversion to trouble will yield substantial bonuses to their pay. Gruntle managed to avoid gaping. He said, uh, that should solve the problem, sir. Karuli said, excellent. Inform Harlow thus then and send him on his way. Gruntle said, yes, sir. The door swung shut. I guess they didn't do a good job negotiating their rates then, huh? <laughs> That's what I hear. Because that guy's like, oh, that was a lot of money. <laughs> was that, was that, I didn't ask for enough. To, I know it's exactly what I'm thinking. It's like, man, y'all did not ask for nearly enough, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could have asked for like 10 times the amount easily, I'm thinking. Didn't do their market research. No, they did not. As it turned out, Harlow was already returning to the carriage fishing pole in one massive hand, a sad sandal sole of a fish clutched in the other. His bright blue eyes danced with excitement. Harlow said, look, you sour excuse for a man. I've caught supper. <laughs> Gruntle said, supper for a monastic rat, you mean? I could inhale that damn thing up one nostril. Harlow scowled, fish soup, flavor. Gruntle interrupted, <laughs> that's just great. I love mud flavored soup. Look, the thing's not even breathing. It was probably dead when you caught it. Harlow said, I banged a rock between its eyes, Gruntle. Gruntle said, must have been a small rock. Harlow retorted, for that you won't get any. Gruntle continued, for that I bless you. Now listen, Stani's getting drunk. Harlow said, funny, I don't hear no brawl. <laughs> yeah, I find it interesting that the woman of the group is the Hellraiser. Yes. Let's hear from Mr. Erickson for having such a great cast of funny humans again. For these people we've never met yet and these guys were just as funny as some of our other old school boys you're like wow these guys are fantastic <laughs> but yes i love that she's the one apparently looking to stab someone anytime anywhere is the impression i get from her right now within a couple paragraphs he really establishes their personalities pretty quickly oh yes real quick gruntle said bonuses from karuli if there isn't one understood 
Harlow glanced at the carriage door, then nodded and said, I'll let her know. This is if there's no fight. Gruntle said, better hurry. Harlow said, right. Gruntle watched him scurry off. The man's arms were enormous, too long and too muscled for the rest of his scrawny frame. His weapon of choice was a two-handed sword purchased from a weaponsmith in Dead Man's Story. As far as those apish arms were concerned, it might be made of bamboo. Harlow's shock of pale blonde hair rode his pate like a tangled bundle of fishing thread. You know what's funny? Now that I'm reading this after having watched Umbrella Academy, <laughs> I realize that Harlow's build is not that dissimilar to Luther's character in that show. He's maybe a bit scrawnier in the chest, but the out-of-proportion arms are definitely there. Yeah, I can totally see that. Strangers laughed upon seeing Harlow for the first time, but he used the flat of a blade to stifle that response. Succinctly. <laughs> I imagine, wow, <laughs> that'll stifle a response real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sighing, Gruntle returned to where Reese stood waiting. He said, lead on. Reese's head bobbed as he said, excellent. The carriage was massive. A house perched on high spoked wheels. Ornate carvings crowded the strangely arched frame. Tiny painted figures capering and climbing with leering expressions. The driver's perch was canopied in sun-faded canvas. Four oxen lumbered freely in a makeshift corral 10 paces downwind from the camp. And I thought it was an interesting choice to have oxen pull the carriage. You would think they'd have some type of getup like the Trigal Trade Guild. Maybe it's too heavy for horses to pull? That could be. And it says it's about as big as a house. It sounds bigger than the Trigals ones almost. But this mm -hmm. one, uh, I, I, I did look up. So the oxen can indeed pull more and they're way more chill than horses and mules. That's that's the big bonus with them is they're just super chill. So the oxen is the semi truck and then the yes. horse is the Ferrari. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Now unless I I'm I don't, I'm not sure where the draft horse falls along that. I've not seen any draft horses in this universe. We've seen some majestic war horses and face bite and magnificent dudes, but not any ones big enough to pull this fella apparently. <laughs> yeah, I don't recall any draft horses. Maybe some poor farmers later might have one or two, but I don't think there's any prominent horses, if I recall, that are that large. The Jag. Are the Jag horses draft horse sizes? Those are different, though. But no, those are bigger. Are they? Okay. Those are bigger. Okay. Sorry. I'll That's start. all right. Privacy obviously mattered to Reese's masters, since they'd parked well away from both the road and the other merchants, affording them a clear view of the hummocks rising on the south side of the road and, beyond it, the broad sweep of the plain. A mangy cat lying on the buckboard watched Reese and Gruntle approach. Gruntle asked, that your cat? Reese squinted at it, then sighed, aye, sir. Her name's Squirrel. Gruntle said, any alchemist or wax witch could treat that mange. Reese seemed uncomfortable as he muttered, I'll be sure to look into it when we get to Saltoan. Ah. He nodded toward the hills beyond the road, then said, here comes Master Boshelaine. Gruntle turned and studied the tall, angular man who'd reached the road and now strode casually toward them. Expensive ankle-length cloak of black leather, high riding boots of the same over-gray leggings, and beneath a loose silk shirt, also black, the glint of fine blackened chain armor. Gruntle said, black was last year's shade in Darujistan. Reese said, black is Boshelaine's eternal shade, sir. <laughs> Such a goth vibe here. Oh my, that's bad. Is what you... <laughs> That's kind of how I picture this guy in a weird way. And now it will remain thus. Uh, really? So the goth kid from the, South Park? It's kind of similar, but just tall. But well, it's like the goth, the, these guys always kind of weird me out. They're kind of odd. But the black on black on black. Basically, it's like black upon blacker upon blackest. Mm, yes. <laughs> they're, they're, I, need, I need more black, please. It's like <laughs> there's not enough black in my outfit. I'll tell you who I think he looks like after we get through this next paragraph. Okay. I'm just kidding. I don't think Boshelaine looks like Golf Kid, but it's just kind okay. of funny. Boshelaine's face was pale, shaped much like a triangle, an impression further accented by a neatly trimmed beard. His hair, slick with oil, was swept back from his high brow. His eyes were flat gray, as colorless as the rest of him, and upon meeting them, Gruntle felt a surge of visceral alarm. To me, he looks like Nicolas Cage. I don't know why. He does kind of have that long is it, face. Is it the chill version or the over-the-top version from the face-off version, as it were, 
or kind of like somewhere in between. <laughs> it's got to be the chill version because Bosch Lane is very collected. I don't think he ever really he is. is out of control. Does it have to do with the Renfield artwork? <laughs> well, that came out much later. I know. Uh, but I mean, I've, I've never seen the movie, but I've seen the artwork. Maybe a little bit. Okay. I'm just curious. I mean, the only new Nicolas Cage movie I've seen was that dream scenario. Well, it's not even a new Nicolas Cage. It's just him, his aura. Just him. Oh, copy that. Okay. You probably have a picture of what Nicolas Cage looks like in your head, and it oh, probably sure. has been roughly the same over the years. Yeah, pretty much. It might minorly adjust, but for me, it's just it's Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Sometimes Nick's got that kind of wild-eyed thing going. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, Absolutely. So, I, so is that what you're seeing is a wild-eyed thing going on? Not really. It's the facial structure and everything. It's not so much the craziness oh. that he's capable of. Oh, None of that. Okay, I got you. Okay, I got you. Bosch Lane said, Captain Gruntle, your employer's prying is none too subtle. But while we are not ones to generally reward such curiosity regarding our activities, this time we shall make an exception. You shall accompany me. He glanced at Reese and said, your cat seems to be suffering palpitations. I suggest you comfort the creature. Reese said, at once, master. <laughs> Gruntle rested his hands on the pommels of his cutlasses, eyes narrowed on Boshelaine. The carriage springs squeaked as Reese clambered up to the buckboard. Boshelaine said, well, captain? Gruntle made no move. Boshelaine raised one thin eyebrow then said, I assure you, your employer is eager that you comply with my request. If, however, you are afraid to do so, you might be able to convince him to hold your hand for the duration of this enterprise. Though, I warn you, levering him into the open may prove something of a challenge, even for a man of your bulk. Gruntle asked, Ever done any fishing? Boshelaine asked, Fishing? Gruntle said, The ones that rise to any old bait are young, and they don't get any older. I've been working caravans for more than 20 years, sir. I ain't young. You want to rise? Fish elsewhere. <laughs> Boshelaine's smile was dry. He said, you reassure me, Captain. Shall we proceed? Gruntle said, lead on. They crossed the road. An old goat trail led them into the hills. The caravan camp this side of the river was quickly lost to sight. The scorched grass of the conflagration that had struck this land marred every slope and summit, although new green shoots had begun to appear. As they walked, Boshelaine noted, fire is essential for the health of these prairie grasses, as is the passage of Bedarin the hooves in their hundreds of thousands compacting the thin soil. Alas, the presence of goats will spell the end of verdancy for these ancient hills. But I began with the subject of fire, did I not? Violence and destruction, both vital for life. Do you find that odd, Captain? Man, those goats are always causing problems. They do. Where the goats are different than sheep, you know, sheep and cattle eat the grass. Goats will pull the grass up. Mm, and eat the trees. Yeah, they'll eat as high as they can reach. But the, it's funny. I know that sheep eat more grass pound for pound, but the goats, they eat everything. They eat everything. <laughs> everything. This concept of the cattle compacting the soil is interesting. I saw a documentary where the scientist in Africa is helping the locals use herds of cattle to revitalize some areas that have lost a lot of plant life. And the results are really impressive. They were able to regrow these vast swaths of land if they keep trampling the oh, ground wow. with the cattle. And then the effects over time is really cool. That's awesome, dude. Gruntle said, what I find odd, sir, is this feeling that I've left my wax tablet behind. He's not the friendliest guy, is he? No. You know, I forget that he's been doing this for a long time. And he is a, a caravan guard. Is that equal to a mercenary? Pretty much. You're protecting whoever pays you to protect them. That's true. Okay. So instead of an army or a country, it's just that whatever your employer is right now. Sure. I guess there is that too. So that may be why he's not necessarily the friendliest guy because he's got 20 years of experience dealing with squirrely people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Bosch Lane said, you have had schooling then. How interesting. You're a swordsman, are you not? What need you for letters and numbers? Gruntle said, and you're a man of letters and numbers. What need you for that well-worn broadsword at your hip and that fancy male hauberk? Uh -huh. Bosch Lane said, an unfortunate side effect of education among the masses is, is lack of respect. I had that highlighted. Yeah? I do. It's a pretty good quote. It's a great quote, dude. <laughs> Gruntle said, healthy skepticism, you mean. Bosch Lane said, disdain for authority, actually. You may have noted, to answer your question, that we have but a single, rather elderly manservant. No hired guards. The need to protect oneself is vital in our profession. Gruntle asked, and what profession is that? They descended onto a well-trodden path winding between the hills. 
Boshelaine paused, smiling as he regarded Gruntle. He said, You entertain me, Captain. I understand now why you are well spoken of among the caravan Sarai, since you are unique among them in possessing a functioning brain. Come, we are almost there. They rounded a battered hillside and came to the edge of a fresh crater. The earth at its base was a swath of churned mud studded with broken blocks of stone. Gruntle judged the crater to be 40 paces across and four or five arm lengths in depth. A man sat nearby on the edge of the rim, also dressed in black leather, his bald pate the color of bleached parchment. He rose silently for all his considerable size and turned to them with fluid grace. Boshlane said, Corbal Broach, Captain, my partner. Corbal, we have here Gruntle, a name that is most certainly a slanting hint to his personality. If Boshlane had triggered unease in the captain, then this man, his broad, round faced, his eyes buried in puffed flesh and wide, full-lipped mouth set slightly downturned at the corners, a face both childlike and ineffably monstrous, sent ripples of fear through Gruntle. Once again, the sensation was wholly instinctive, as if Boshlane and his partner exuded an aura somehow tainted. This guy always struck me as slightly Uncle Fester-ish from the Adams family. Agreed. I get that. A simple, more brutal version of Fester, for sure. <laughs> I get that for sure. The fact that he puts the willies on to Gruntle says something right there. Both of them kind of give him the willies. Yeah, I wouldn't expect someone with this much experience to experience a ton of fear right now. I can understand you having like some... Caution? Yeah, caution. Be like, hey, you know what? I don't know y'all. I'm going to, you know, kind of keep my eye on y'all. But this is like, this sounds like, a, especially in, in particular, seeing this guy. I was like, whoa, put a little fear on him. <laughs> like, yeah. Under his breath, Gruntle muttered, no wonder the cat had palpitations. <laughs> It's like the same thing from South Park where you see that. It's like, I see that you like cutting the eyes out of pictures of women. My son also likes doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's almost like he's that guy, you know? And you're like, hmm. He pulled his gaze from Corball Brooch and studied the crater. Boshlane moved to stand beside him and asked, Do you understand what you are seeing, Captain? Gruntle said, I, I'm no fool. It's a hole in the ground. Boshlane said, Amusing. A barrel once stood here. Within it was chained a Jagoot tyrant. Gruntle noted, was. <laughs> Boshlane said, indeed, a distant empire meddled, or so I gather. And in league with a Talani mass, they succeeded in freeing the creature. Gruntle said, you give credence to the tales then. If such an event occurred, then what in Hood's name happened to it? Boshlane said, we wondered the same, Captain. We are strangers to this continent. Until recently, we'd never heard of the Malazan Empire, nor the wondrous city called Darujistan. During our all-too-brief stay there, however, we heard stories of events just past. Demons, dragons, assassins, and the Azath house named Finest, which cannot be entered yet, seems to be occupied nonetheless. We paid that a visit, of course. More, we'd heard tales of a floating fortress called Moonspawn that once hovered over the city. Gruntle interrupted, I, I'd seen that with my own eyes. It left a day before I did. There's something about the way Boshlane worded that. The Azath house named Finnis, which cannot be entered yet, that makes me think that they've been inside an Azath or two before. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's most assuredly the, that word. <laughs> uh -huh. did, you can't get into it yet. Like, wait, what? <laughs> Have y'all been doing this? Uh -huh. Y'all break into these houses? What are y'all housebreakers? I mean, <laughs> How would they get in? Do they have some secret information that allows them to enter? These guys are something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. They are far more than they seem. That's a fact. The other thing I found, this is the first time we have seen someone or I've heard of someone in the world having not heard or confessing to have had no prior knowledge to the Malazan Empire before arriving here says something to the size of this world again, to places that we have not yet been introduced to. and. I don't know if we ever are. Good point. Makes you wonder where they're from. Yeah. Also, now that we see how the Azath are named, I'd like to know more about Tremorlore and Deadhouse. What gave them their names? Yeah, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about that at all until you stated that. Yeah, because they named this one Finest, which was the acorn that caused it to grow. Exactly. So we got Deadhouse and Tremorlore. Deadhouse kind of makes sense in a way. But tremor lore is very intriguing. How does Dead House make sense to you? What are you picking up there? Like a cemetery. I thought every Azath had a cemetery. Kind of does. I mean, they they do. But this one, that this one in particular, has the vibe. For some reason, in this world, I don't know why I get this impression from these Azath. Certain ones in particular remind me of like Victorian era. 
white picket fence, you know, that kind of house just sitting over there by itself. Yeah, you, know, you don't want to go over there. The paint may be peeling on it. I'm not sure if they're in good shape or anything, but it's like, I imagine a house built like that or something from a Western almost, you know, some kind of a clabbered house aside. I don't, I'm not sure how to put it exactly. It's, it's They're listed as double as like something I would imagine in New England because they said they're very similar, at least the ones that we've seen and been inside. It sound like they almost have a similar layout. Like Dead House and Trimble or something that almost have the same layout. I'm thinking of the best way to describe how they appear to me. They're always stone blocks for their walls. And then oh, oh, there's okay. a couple towers, overgrown yes. vines around them. And then the yard looks unkempt. So I think the piece of it to me that is similar to what you're saying is the unkempt yard aspect of it. Yes. Where yes. it obviously looks like an abandoned house. Yes. It's like an abandoned house with, I'm assuming, in dead house would look more like a cemetery more than anything in particular. Up to the house, right? With uh, the humps in the yard. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's my, that's kind of my impression. Trimmer lore, I got no idea. But, but I'm assuming Trimmer lore looks almost the exact same, though. Yeah, I think they all look very similar. Yeah. Okay. Boshelaine sighed. Alas, it appears we have come too late to witness for ourselves these dire wonders. A Tistandy lord rules Moonspawn, I gather. Gruntle shrugged and said, if you say so, personally, I dislike gossip. Finally, Boshelaine's eyes hardened. Gruntle smiled inwardly. Boshelaine said, gossip indeed. Gruntle asked, this is what you wanted to show me then? This hole? Boshelaine raised an eyebrow and said, not precisely. This hole is but the entrance. We intend to visit the Jagoot tomb that lies below it. Gruntle said, Opon's blessing to you then. He turned away. Behind him, Boshelaine said, I imagine that your master would urge you to accompany us. Gruntle said he can urge all he likes. I wasn't contracted to sink into a pool of mud. <laughs> Boshelaine said, we've no intention of getting covered in mud. Gruntle glanced back at him, crooked a wry grin, and said, a figure of speech, Boshelaine. Apologies if you misunderstood. He swung round again and made his way towards the trail. Then he stopped and said, you wanted to see Moonspawn, sirs? He pointed. Like a towering black cloud, the basalt fortress stood just above the south horizon. Boots crunched on the ragged gravel, and Gruntle found himself standing between the two men, both of whom studied the distant floating mountain. Boshlane muttered, scale is difficult to determine. How far away is it? Gruntle said, I'd guess a league, maybe more. Trust me, sirs, it's close enough for my taste. I've walked its shadow in Darujistan, hard not to for a while there, and believe me, it's not a comforting feeling. Boshelaine said, I imagine not. What is it doing here? Gruntle shrugged and said, seems to be heading southeast. Boshelaine noted, hence the tilt. Gruntle corrected, no, it was damaged over pale by mages of the Malazan Empire. Boshelaine said, impressive effort, these mages. Gruntle said, they died for it, most of them anyway, so I heard. Besides, while they managed to damage Moonspawn, its lord remains hale. If you want to call kicking a hole in a fence before getting obliterated by the man who owns the house impressive, Go right ahead. Corbald Broach finally spoke, his voice reedy and high-pitched. He said, Boshelaine, does he sense us? Boshelaine frowned, eyes still on Moonspawn, then shook his head and said, I detect no such attention accorded us, friend, but that is a discussion that should await a more private moment. Corbald Broach said, very well. You don't want me to kill this caravan guard then? Whoa, <laughs> danger. So we're already to the, oh, you don't want me to kill this guy part of the introductions, are we? He jumps right to it. Boy, he does. Yes, he does. Now I would give Gruntle license to be afraid because it's like, okay, yeah. you know, these guys got me out here in the middle of nowhere. I'm by myself. I'm surrounded by them. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone's and, talking and about Gruntle, killing me. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's funny, Gruntle seems very capable, but this guy is talking about like, oh, so I'm not supposed to just kill him. You know, I, the impression I get is kind of the George and Lenny from Of Mice and Men kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it does feel that way a little bit, doesn't it? Almost. Yeah, he seems a little slow. A little slow. Reaction time's a little off. Now, I'm wondering if that's due to their occupation. <laughs> Has their occupation done something to this fella? Say no more, good sir. Okay. <laughs> I thought that question about whether Rake detects their presence says a lot. Who the heck are these guys? They have a pretty, let's put it like this. They're very confident sounding gentlemen. And 
that question does freak me out as the reader. You know, Gruntel has every reason to not know anything about that because he seems to be kind of the guy on the street for the most part. But these fellows, to ask that kind of question, that means that they merit Rake's attention. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. They must have an aura. Yes, pretty big aura. Gruntel stepped away in alarm, half drawing his cutlasses. He growled, you'll regret the attempt. Boshlane smiled and said, be calmed, Captain. My partner has simple notions. Gruntel said, simple as an adder's, you mean? Boshlane said, perhaps. Nonetheless, I assure you, you are perfectly safe. Scowling, Gruntel backed away down the trail. He whispered, Master Karuli, if you're watching all this, and I think you are, I trust my bonus will be appropriately generous. And if my advice is worth anything, I suggest we stride clear and wide of these two. Moments before he moved beyond sight of the crater, he saw Boshelaine and Corbal Broach turn their backs on him and Moonspawn. They stared down into the hole for a brief span, then began the descent, disappearing from view. Sighing, Gruntle swung about and made his way back to the camp, rolling his shoulders to release tension. As he reached the road, his gaze lifted once more, southward to find Moonspawn, hazy now with distance. He said, You there, Lord. I wish you had caught the scent of Boshelaine and Corbal Broach, so you do to them what you did to the Jagoot Tyrant, assuming you had a hand in that. Preventative medicine, the cutters call it. I only pray we don't all one day come to regret your disinterest. Walking down the road, he glanced over to see Reese sitting atop the carriage, one hand stroking the ragged cat in his lap. Mange? Gruntle considered, then thought, probably not. Do you think that cat is something more? It could very well be. This world is full of a lot of something more, is it? aren't they? Isn't Moby it? comes to so, mind. Yeah. Moby comes to mind. There's other things that we're hanging around with. The dog demon. The, yes, the dog demon. <laughs> so, yeah, other things around and abound in this universe that, yeah, it's like it could very well be. It could be some kind of demon. It could be some kind of soul taken or diver. Uh, maybe, probably not divers, but I'm assuming it could be a soul taken, though, maybe. I'm not sure. Nothing would surprise me, sir. <laughs> Oh, it was Crone that looked like the dog that when uh, yeah, oh, yes. was there, the councilman. The other, the, other demon, the, the other demon was about the size of a dog. That's I right. Think, was yeah. the, I always think, I would crush this city. You know, <laughs> he's flying around. Well, <laughs> what's, what's crazy to think about is the fact that that small, I'm sorry, and I'm using air quotes for small, That's if that thing is powerful enough to possibly do that, and we saw some definitely bigger boys out in the field there, and we know those fellas were definitely dangerous. So yes. sometimes being necessarily small doesn't mean this guy can't call down a whooping. <laughs> right. It's just so funny because one minute he's doing over being – enslaved by baruch and then the next he's getting a boot oh that is in the back of the though. head and he's it running back funny. to his master for protection <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that is funny stuff i guess me every time we go somewhere else the huge wolf circled the body head low and turned inward to keep the unconscious mortal within sight of its lone eye the warrant of chaos had few visitors among those few mortal humans were rarest of all the wolf had wandered this violent landscape for a time that was, to it, immeasurable. Alone and lost for so long, its mind had found new shapes born of solitude. The tracks of its thoughts twisted on seemingly random routes. Few would recognize awareness or intelligence in the feral gleam of its eye, yet they existed nonetheless. The wolf circled, massive muscles rippling beneath the dull white fur. Head low and turned inward, lone eye fixed on the prone human. The fierce concentration was efficacious, holding the object of his attention in a state that was timeless, an accidental consequence of the powers the wolf had absorbed within this warren. The wolf recalled little of the other worlds that existed beyond chaos. It knew nothing of the immortals who worshipped it as they would a god. Yet a certain knowledge had come to it, an instinctive sensitivity that told it of possibilities, of potentials, of choices now available to the wolf with the discovery of this frail mortal. Even so, the creature hesitated. There were risks, and the decision that now gnawed its way to the forefront had the wolf trembling. Its circling spiraled inward, closer, ever closer to the unconscious figure, lone eye fixing finally on the man's face. The gift the creature saw at last was a true one. Nothing else could explain what it discovered in the mortal man's face. A mirrored spirit in every detail. This was an opportunity that could not be refused. Still the wolf hesitated, until an ancient memory rose before its mind's eye, an image frozen, faded with the erosion of time, sufficient to close the spiral. And then it was done. What was done? Tune in next week to find out. <laughs>
We're going to stop there. <laughs> we'll finish out the chapter next week. Nice. I will point out one thing, though. This is the wolf from the prologue. So it mentioned it saw silvery light coming through when it opened the warren in the prologue. Yes. To be in chaos for over 100,000 years sounds like an absolute nightmare. Yes, it does. <laughs> Alone? Ugh. Sounds like yeah. it'll be almost like some type of acid or ayahuasca trip. The longest ever. Having all that pure creation around you? Yeah, it'd be yeah. crazy. It's probably one of those things where it's lost its mind and come back and lost, you know, because it's what's, you know, who's to tell what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the image that it's seeing that reminded it was the female that it was searching for. Yeah, that's my guess. All right, for standout moments. I appreciate how the events from Gardens of the Moon directly feed into the story kicking off with the bridge getting knocked down and the Jagoot Tyrant and the aftermath of all that. Yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. As we get deeper in this series, you start seeing all this. Wow, this has all been connected from the get go. That's what's crazy. Yeah, especially because it causes Gruntle to be stuck on the shore. He meets Bosch Lane and Corball Brooch, and then we'll see where that goes. Yes. <laughs> I also enjoy how quickly the personalities of Gruntle, Stani, and Harlow are introduced in such a short section. Gruntle is the grizzled veteran, Stani is the firecracker, and Harlow is the optimist. I thought that was mm. excellent work by Mr. Erickson. Oh, I love it. You know, and I, so much of his all uh, his human characters in particular, you know, they have these traits you tend to remember. Do you think a lot of these characters live in his and Esselmont's D and D world? Is this why they have such a lived in, why this place in particular has a lived in feel? Do you imagine that has something to do with it? Like they may have had some backstory for these people already? From what I've heard, the major, major characters were in their D&D story. I don't know how extensive that roster goes down, though. Okay. I'm not sure what he invented as part of the story to flesh it out. Sure. Because we know that Rake is definitely in there. Kellon Ved, Dancer, they role-played them for sure. Right. I can't think of any others off the top of my head. Okay. I'm just kind of curious if they, if they just had built a bunch of other characters. Maybe they just, we already got a bunch of the details on these folks. We got a file on this guy and a file on that guy. And maybe not. It's just, it's, I was just curious about that. I seem to remember that they role-played the fate. Oh, wow. That whole party, I, I imagine they had to play different characters throughout that whole scene. Yeah, sure. Wow. So maybe one of them That's was so awesome, playing dude. Relic Nom. Oh, that's cool. And then finally, the thing I enjoyed last was the enigma of Boshelaine and Corball Brooch. Who and what are they? Yeah. I forgot that we're introduced to them right so quick. And the fact that they're wondering if Rake sends them, it's like, dude, that's an intriguing thought. It's like they think of themselves highly, and maybe there's a reason for it. I guess we'll learn. I'm hoping we'll learn. Yeah, definitely. All right, great job tonight, Billy. Yeah, you know, great episode, bro. Great story. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I do. Erickson's prologue, this is going to go back to the beginning, his prologue seemed kind of removed from the actual times that we're covering in each book. And I always look forward to where the prologue meets up with the story. And But, you know, his books, his they're so significant. They're not just prehistory. And having said that, I just love how chapter one starts. Such a great intro on some of these folks living in the aftermath of the fate from Gardens of the Moon. Uh, great and significant characters we're introduced already to. Can't wait to get to know them really deeply in the way that we've been doing through these other two books, man. And uh, really, <laughs> just always love Reese. <laughs> <laughs> Made some poor Reese. Yeah, the poor guy. <laughs> I forget that he's chapter one for good gracious. It's like, I good gracious, 10 minutes in, we've already met Reese. Like, wow, that's too funny. I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> I've completely yeah. forgotten that. That's great, man. Great start to the book, though. Absolutely. I know we technically started with the prologue, but what when you hit chapter one past the prologue, that's where the rubber meets the road so much in, in, the, in these Erickson books. And it's like, yes, here we go. The second half of chapter one, it, oh man, some of the characters oh. that are introduced there, it's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. That's a lot dude. of characters to introduce in the first chapter between this section and that one. Yeah. And they do it. You know, it's funny. I think that, you know, because his books always have such a large roster, but they don't tend to introduce so many all at once. It's like, I guess we're professionals now. We've read through two of his books. It's like, you can handle it. I'm going to introduce you to a bunch of guys real quick. You know? <laughs> oh. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hey, we'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. 
Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.